Donald J. Boudreau is a professor of economics and senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek program for advanced study in philosophy, politics, and economics at George Mason University. He holds the Martha and ne Nelson Gretchel Chair for the study of free market capitalism at the Mercatus Center. He specializes in globalization and trade law and economics and antitrust economics. Boudreau is committed to making economics more accessible to a wider audience, and he has lectured across the United States, Canada, Latin America, and Europe on a wide variety of topics, including antitrust law and, inter and international trade. He is the author of the books Hypocrites and Half Wits, A Daily Dose of Sanity from Cafe Hayek, and Globalization. His articles appear in such publications as the Wall Street Journal and US News and World Report, as well as numerous scholarly journals. He writes a blog with Russell Roberts called Cafe Hayek and a regular column on economics for the Pitts, uh, Pittsburgh Tribune Review. He has appeared numerous times on John Stossel's Fox News show to discuss a range of economic issues. Previously, he was president of the Foundation for Economic Education and an associate professor of legal studies and economics at Clemson University. He also serves as an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Tonight, you will hear the case for free trade. We give you Donald J. Boudreau. Is there a mic, or is, is, am I mic'd? What? You are mic'd. Oh, wow, that's amazing. Right. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and I, uh, I apologize for being late. It's truly my fault. My hosts are too polite to say otherwise. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I teach at George Mason, and I have to teach tomorrow night. And, I, and this class meets only once a week. And so one of my conditions for coming here uh, is that I get back in time to teach. And so that's possible, but that has me leaving out of Flint tomorrow at 6 AM. That's early. That's the time the flight leaves from Flint. And so the plan was to take me out to dinner after the talk. And I said, nah, I'd kind of like to like, get back to the, air, to the hotel uh, in Flint, where I'm staying, so uh, I can wake up in time tomorrow. So we had dinner. We changed plans. We had dinner early. And it's because of that that we're late. So I'm to blame. And I, I, so I apologize uh, for making uh, you all wait. I, I, I hope, against hope, that it's worth waiting for. This is actually my second time speaking at Northwood. I spoke here uh, the first time in 1997. Uh, and uh, it was, a, it was a, 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 a very fond experience, as I recall. So I'm happy to be back uh, uh, speaking here. So I'm, I'm here to make the and I do I have uh, the PowerPoints later? Okay, I don't I don't need them right now, but but uh, at some point so um, I can get by without them. But they're pretty pictures, and I want to show them to you. Uh, so I'm here to make a case for free trade, and, and I should I should tell you that, uh, and I believe in truth in advertising. Um, so I I live in Virginia, Virginia for reasons I'm not quite sure of has the largest percentage of its automobiles with vanity tags. And I have a vanity tag. And I've had this vanity tag for many, many years. And on the vanity tag in Virginia, you get to have a maximum of seven characters and one space. And uh, my vanity tag on my, my Virginia vanity tag on my foreign assembled automobile reads F-R-E space T-R-D-E. So free. You know, it's as close as I can get to free trade with seven characters and a space. So I'm a free trader. Uh, I'm, I'm unapologetic about that. I'm an economist. Most economists are free traders. Unfortunately, most economists have done a poor job uh, over the past few centuries making the case. And so I want to try to make that case with you, for you, uh, more clearly than most of my fellow economists who understand and believe in the case for free trade, but they're very poor, generally, at making the case for free trade. So at, at Northwood, I mean, especially during a, uh, a celebration called Freedom Week, uh, you'd think that uh, such a case wouldn't have to be made. And maybe until two or three years ago, I too would have thought that it, such a case doesn't have to be made. But for reasons that I won't spell out, but I'll leave you to figure out, uh, uh, 
the case for free trade today in the United States, maybe even in the world, is under a greater assault and battery than at any time in my lifetime. And I'm a few months older than you. So that's a joke. I'm actually several months older than you. Uh, so I want to I want to uh, make the positive case for free trade. Um, it's pretty straightforward. I'm going to break it down into ten elemental points. I think they make sense. I'll try to persuade you that they make sense. You may or may not believe me, but it, I think it's a pretty good summary of the case for free trade. Before I do that, before I get to my ten points, I want to make one meta point. Uh, it's a point that my great colleague at George Mason, Walter Williams, whom some of you may know or know of, always makes. And he makes it in this way. He says, nations don't trade. Countries don't trade. Societies don't trade. Individuals trade. Flesh and blood individuals trade. All trade is done only by flesh and blood individuals. Sometimes it's done by an individual as an individual, like when you go to lunch to buy a sandwich, uh, or uh, uh, after a hard uh, weeks of, of, of work to go out and buy a freshly crafted root beer. You're too young to drink, so you drink root beer instead, I know. Uh, or sometimes you as an individual trade as an agent for, for a collection of individuals, a, a mom who buys groceries for the week for her family. Uh, a CEO of a corporation, large or small, who is empowered by the owners of that corporation to make purchasing and sales decisions uh, on behalf of the owners of that corporation. But in all cases, trade is only done by individuals. It is a mistake to think of trade as being done by America. There is no such thing as America who trades with this thing called China. America doesn't have a brain. China doesn't have a brain. It's Amer people in America buying and selling, choosing in each case to buy and sell with people in China who do the same thing. Governments trade, of course, individuals and governments, but societies as a whole don't trade. In all such cases, from a household consisting of a single individual to the corporation, the trade is only done by individuals. No such agency relationship as exists in a corporation or a household exist in a nation. If we say that America buys goods from China, what we really mean is that a number of individuals in America, not acting together to achieve some unified collective concrete goal, buys goods from individuals in China, who themselves are not acting together to achieve some collective unified goal in the way that the president of Google is acting to achieve some unified goal for Google when he makes or she makes decisions for that company. It's true that the results of the trading decisions that Americans make have some collective outcomes, so too in China, so too in Great Britain, so too in every other country, but the purpose of our trades that we make as Americans is not to make America great now or again. It's to make each of us, our households and our companies, as, better, as best off as we can make them. So if you, if you sense, and you might, that I'm spending too much time on this meta point, I know from experience that I'm not. The reason is that far too many people evaluate international trade uh, or the results of international uh, trade that is undertaken by a multitude of people in any nation as if the nation is a big scaled up household or a big scaled up uh, firm. And it's not. Uh, a household has a budget. A firm has a budget. A government has a budget. A nation does not have a budget. So when you talk about America's budget, America doesn't have a budget. Uncle Sam has a budget. The state of Michigan has a budget. The city of Midland has a budget. Your household has a budget. You individually have a budget. America does not have a budget. And so you can't evaluate the outcomes of, you can't evaluate the outcomes of all individuals trading to pursue their own ends as if they are all trying to maximize the budget of a nation because the budget of a nation does not exist, although a lot of discussion often takes place as if there is this imaginary budget to which all of us as Americans should turn our attention when we choose to buy and sell things. But such a budget is, is mythical. Um, so let me now get to, after making that meta point, which I think is 
I know is important to keep in mind. Let me break my case for free trade down into 10 points. The first two of which are the only two that really enjoy pride of place. These are in no particular order except for the first two. I think they are especially fundamental and elemental. So first, nothing about political borders justifies treating trades that cross these borders differently than trades that don't. Whatever benefits results when you trade with someone in Kansas or Kentucky are no less available than when you trade with someone in Canada or Korea. Whatever problems, real or imaginary, that occur when you trade with someone in Canada or Korea are also possible when you trade with someone in Kansas or Kentucky. Second, all economic activity is ultimately justified by how much it enables us to expand our consumption. Consumption is the end, production is the means. Now, production is an essential means, it's a very important means, it's a means that is very easy to overlook, some people overlook it, but we must not overlook, if you're trying to make a case for freedom and free trade, we must not overlook the fact that production is a means, it's not the end. We produce ultimately in order to consume. Production isn't the ultimate end of economic activity. If you disbelieve me, um, then ask, do this mental experiment. Uh, suppose you go into a restaurant and you, order, you, you, you really want dessert, and so you order dessert, you, you tell the, the, the restaurant owner, bring me your best dessert. The restaurant owner comes back and brings you a sawdust nail and, and, and cement pie. And the, and the restaurant owner assures you, and you believe the restaurant owner, that he worked really hard to bake this pie, worked for hours, days to bake it, put a lot of labor into it. Clearly, it's a lot of production, but it's production that's wasted because you and no one else wants to eat a sawdust nail and cement pie. We judge the value of production by how well it contributes to what we want to consume, by how much it satisfies our desires as consumers. Number three, output expands with the specialization of production. And the greater the amount of specialization, the greater the expansion of output. A medical profession of 100 physicians, each of whom practices general medicine, what's today called family practice, will save fewer lives and reduce less pain than will a medical profession of 100 physicians, many of whom are specialists, such as neurosurgeons, podiatrists, cardiologists, ophthalmologists, and, and my favorite, uh, pediatric gastroenterologists. I have a son who's now about your age. He's, he just turned 20. And when he was three years old, we, we were living in just outside of New York City at the time. When he was three years old, he got a disease I'd never heard of, or an ailment, uh, 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 viral-induced pseudo-obstruction. Never heard of it. It almost killed him, uh, and it, it certainly would have killed him 50, certainly 100 years ago. Uh, and uh, his life was saved because in New York, there, there was a practice of physicians who focused on pediatric gastroenterology. So not only physicians that focused on kids, the health of kids, not only physicians who focused on problems associated with the gastrointestinal function of the body, but physicians who focused only on children's gastrointestinal issues. That means when they focus on that, they can become really good at it, much better at it than if they had to spend part of their time worrying about kids' eyesight or kids' nasal passages. So the more we specialize, the more productive we each become. Fourth, specialization requires trade. A pediatric gastroenterologist today enjoys a high standard of living but only because many people willingly pay him or her to specialize in that highly specialized line of work and willingly accept his money in exchange for what they produce. This physician is rich only because he trades with others. If farmers, carpenters, economics professors, airline pilots did not want to trade with him, he couldn't afford, it was a he in this case, Dr. Howard Bostwick, I'll never forget the guy's name. He couldn't afford to specialize in pediatric gastroenterology. He couldn't even afford to specialize in medicine. He'd have to build his own house and grow his own food and, 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 and weave his own clothing. It's because we are willing to trade 
that were able to specialize. Fifth, specialization increases with the size of the market. This was a great insight of the founder of economics, a particular uh, hero of mine who you probably heard of, but if you haven't, you ought to hear of him, the uh, 19th century, excuse me, 18th century Scottish moral philosopher Adam Smith. This, this son I mentioned to you would have been named Adam Smith, uh, were it not the case that at the time my wife was pregnant for my son, we had a Scottish Terrier dog named Adam Smith, and my wife wouldn't have the child named after the dog. So she wasn't as fond of the real Adam Smith as, as I was. I'm sorry, our son's not named Adam Smith, but I would have named him Adam Smith. That's how fond I am of Adam Smith. And Adam Smith made an important point. As he put it, uh, uh, the size of the market, the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market. That was his fancy way of saying uh, the amount of specialization that exists in a society is limited by the number of people, consumers, in the market. The greater the size of the market, the more likely it is that there will be a large enough number of consumers to support a narrow specialization. This fact is why large cities have really highly specialized restaurants, vegan Lebanese, and, uh, 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 vegetarian Indian restaurants. If you go to a, a smaller town, smaller towns have fewer highly specialized restaurants than in larger cities. That's because the number of consumers in smaller towns is smaller than in larger cities. So the degree of specialization in larger cities is greater than it is in smaller towns. The more people we have trading in the, in, with each other, the greater the degree of specialization. And again, because as the degree of specialization rises, the productivity of each worker rises, the larger the number of people in the trading group, the more productive the society becomes. And these points four and five work together to spark a virtuous cycle of self-reinforcing improvements. More trade promotes more specialization. More specialization promotes more trade. Sixth, and related in some ways to point number five, an important consequence of expanding the area of trade, of increasing the size of the market, is what economists call increasing returns. Doubling the number of people who trade freely with Americans causes the value of the economic output of this larger economy to more than double. Increasing returns is really just a fancy way of saying that. Per capita income, per person income, in other words or per, per person GDP, if you want to measure it that way, rises for all of these people who trade freely with each other, and it rises in, more, in a greater proportion than the number of people in the market. Compare medical care in a town of 3,000 that has only 10 physicians. That's about roughly the proportion of physicians of, in America today, one to every, every 300. So if you compare it, Imagine what medical care is in a small town of 3,000 with 10 physicians, most of whom will be family practice physicians, to medical care in a much larger town of 300,000 with 100 family practice physicians and 900 specialist physicians. The number of physicians per person is the same in both cases, but the quality of medical care is higher in the second case, because you can have a larger number of physicians specializing, making physicians as a whole more productive. They can cure more illnesses and ease more pain than they can if they were not as specialized. Number seven, there's no limit to the degree to which labor can specialize and to which, as a result, total output can expand and expand at an increasing rate that is, exhibit these increasing returns that I mentioned a moment ago. Put differently, the degree to which labor can specialize and cause total output to expand isn't limited to or defined by the size of any particular country, nor does the size of any particular country define the point beyond which, or the boundaries beyond which, the growth of specialization stops or is slowed or becomes more uncertain. Put even differently, there's nothing about political boundaries, however important you think they may be, and whatever other function they may serve. There's nothing about political boundaries that defines the natural economic boundaries of an economy, that, that, that defines economic boundaries. We too often know, because we talk in ways that are misleading, we talk about the American economy, the Chinese economy, the German economy, 
There's a certain meaning to that, but we have to be careful. The economy to which America belongs is a global economy. The economy to which Germany belongs is a global economy. Same with China. And that's because the, the, the trading patterns span well beyond the political borders of each of those countries. Even in a country as geographically large and as diverse as this very large continent on which America, the United States of America, sits, we still gain by trading with people outside of America. We here in Michigan, or where I live in Virginia, we gain just as much by expanding our trade with Mexicans as we do if we expand our trade with New Mexicans. There's, just, there, there, there's no difference. If you have an opportunity to engage in more productive enterprise, as, either as a consumer or as a producer, with someone in Mexico, that's just as possible as it is to have, if you engage in the same sort of activity with someone in New Mexico. The fact that there is a, a, a national boundary rather than just a state boundary separating you from Mexicans rather than you from New Mexicans is economically irrelevant. Eighth, economic competition is good and it works just as effectively across political boundaries as it does within political boundaries. Competition disciplines firms. It spurs entrepreneurial creativity and it discovers and encourages, much like the process of natural selection, what works best economically. Importantly, the competition that comes from free trade directs workers and other resources into those lines of productive activities that are most efficient, that allow them to contribute most to their fellow human beings. Protectionism keeps workers and other resources in lines of activities that prevent them or allow them to escape having to contribute as much as they otherwise would to the well-being of their fellow human beings. There's simply no reason to neuter with trade restrictions competition that comes from abroad simply because that competition is not homegrown. If a restaurateur, an automaker, whatever, whatever the producer, to the extent that that person responds to competitive pressures from others, that's good for the consumer. And where that competitive, competitive pressure comes from is irrelevant. In, no matter whether it comes from a, a domestic rival or a foreign rival, the effect on the consumer, the effect on the economy is the same. The producer is much more responsive to consumers. The producer is much more likely to keep costs down and be creative in seeking to serve consumers in the market. Ninth, as the late Julian Simon taught, human beings in market economies are the ultimate resource. The ultimate resource is not land, it's not petroleum, it's not iron ore, it's not tungsten, it's not magnesium. It's here, it's what's in your head. If you think about it, nothing is a resource. We talk about natural resources. It's a term I don't like because there are no natural resources. Nothing is naturally a resource. Something is a resource if some human being has figured out how to use that thing to satisfy human goals, to make other human beings happier. And not only to, how to do that, but how to do it economically. I can't prove this, but I'm pretty sure that Native Americans who were wandering around the western Pennsylvania forests 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 5,000 years ago, when they went to get a drink of water out of the brooks and streams that ran through those forests, probably regarded the the smelly, thick, black stuff that was bubbling up in those streams and brooks to be a nuisance rather than a resource. It wasn't until someone came along in the 19th century to discover not only that petroleum, crude oil, can be used to satisfy human wants, but also figure out how to capture that use in an economically viable way that natural, excuse me, that crude oil became a resource. There are no resources that human beings themselves do not create. We create resources. There's raw material, there's stuff, there's atoms, there are molecular structures out there. None of those have any value to humanity until and unless a creative human mind figures it out. But given that that's the case, why would 
any economy, why would people in any economy wish to restrict that economy's access to the ultimate resource with trade restrictions? When we trade with foreigners, we tap into the creativity of others. There are a lot of Americans. It's fine to tap into our, our creativity, too. We are creative people as well. But there are only 325 million of us. The world has close to 7.5 billion people, not all of whom are in market economies. It's true. But it's got billions of people out there who are willing to trade with us, billions of creative minds out there. And whenever we erect barriers to trading with them, we're basically saying, we don't want your creativity. Keep your creativity to yourself. If you think it's good to have resources, if you think it'd be, it would be good if somehow new oil deposits were discovered in, in America, new deposits of iron ore discovered in the United States, new deposits of magnesium were discovered in the United States. If one day it started raining down tractors and bulldozers out of the sky, some weird meteorological event that could be used to, to do productive things. If you think that's, and I think that would be good too. That's not going to happen. But I think it'd be great. I think you probably think it would be great too. Because you understand that more resources are good. Well, trading with foreigners is a way to gain access to more of the ultimate resource, the human mind. Tenth, restriction, this is more a, a more practical one, but it is not an unimportant point. Restrictions on trade inevitably are driven by special interest group politics. Even if a sound theoretical case can be made for trade restrictions, and there are a handful of really weird, esoteric, tweaky cases you can make for trade restrictions, but they are really rare, economic cases. Uh, even if a sound theoretical case can be made for trade restrictions, it's simply unrealistic, unbelievable, I would argue, to expect the state to be guided by that theoretical case. Politicians and bureaucrats are not social engineers. They like you to think that they are social engineers. Politicians and bureaucrats are politicians and bureaucrats. Politicians specialize in winning elections. Bureaucrats specialize in pleasing politicians who specialize in winning elections. Politicians and bureaucrats will only use the case for restricting free trade as cover, political cover, to create monopoly privileges for politically influential producer groups. You show me a tariff, you show me an import restriction, I will show you a powerful producer group who earns artificially high profits as a result and consumers who pay artificially high prices as a result. That's it. That is the complete case for free trade boiled down, well, that is a summary case of free trade boiled down into 10 lessons. If I, I teach a whole course every semester on, or at least once a year on trade, we go into a lot more detail, it takes a whole semester, I have more time then than I have with you today. A more elaborate course goes into a lot more detail, it goes behind these element, elementary points, the exceptions are fleshed out more fully, both the political and the uh, economic uh, uh, aspects of trade are explored in more depth, but don't let the simplicity, I think it is simple, simplicity of the case for free trade uh, uh, deceive you into thinking that it is a simplistic case for free trade. Before I have a handful of pictures that I want to end with here, uh, but before I get to them, let me just point out, the trade that we're talking about is voluntary trade. You are choosing to spend your money buying something from that person because that person gives you the best deal for however much money you spend buying the good from that person. That person who sells it to you is also voluntarily trading with you. If you understand that you voluntarily, that you, get, that you gain voluntarily when you trade with a person across the street or a person across town, a person across the state, a person across the country, then why would you not gain if you trade with someone across the globe. Let me, how do I get, do I just touch the screen or? 
to, oh, 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 okay, someone's doing it for me. I have a, I have a, I don't know who I'm trading with, but thank you. <laughs> so uh, l let me, I just have a few pictures here to um, address what I'm guessing from a good deal of experience are some of the uh, remaining f most firm questions or, or, or counterpoints that people may raise. No doubt, the single most worrisome concern people have about trade is, involves jobs. The concern is, well, if we trade more with foreigners, we lose jobs. And the economist comes back, I think correctly, saying, look, you're thinking about it in a mistaken way. There are no fixed number of jobs in an economy. And this first picture I'm showing you, I can see it here too, so I can point here, so I'm seeing what you're seeing, um, shows the, uh, the, the, the green line is the U.S. civilian labor force, you know, not military. U.S. civilian labor force from 1950 and through 2016 in millions. In 1950, it was about 62 million. There were about 62 million people aged 16 to above who were either in jobs, working in the market, or actively looking for jobs in the market. That's the labor force. That yellow line is U.S. civilian employment, people actually who have jobs outside of the military. And you can see that as we go from 1950 through today, that green line grows pretty steadily. Today it's about 150 percent higher than it was just 67 years ago, 150 percent higher. Not only double the number of people, but double it and then add another half to that. And the yellow line is the number of jobs. That too has grown. The difference between the yellow line and the green line is the unemployment rate. Right? There's never a time when the unemployment rate is zero. There are always some people out of work in those periods when the distance between the green line and the yellow line is relatively large, those are periods of employment recessions. But correcting for, so that, that big steep uh, uh, fall in the yellow line near, near the end of the graph, near, the, the, the 20, near, near the, this part of the graph here, that's the 2007 and on recession, it's recovering. But the point to see is that as a secular matter, the number of jobs is a function of, depends upon the number of people in the workforce. There's no fixed number of jobs. If there were a fixed number of jobs, and as the labor force in the United States grew since 1950, then the unemployment rate today would be astronomically high. Almost everyone today, we, almost every American would be without a job. So there are no fixed number of jobs. Next slide, please. This slide shows uh, the relationship from 1950 through 2016. Uh, of imports to the U.S. civilian uh, employment. That's the same yellow line that I had up earlier, the number of jobs in the U.S. workforce, the gre uh, again, outside of the military. The green line is the uh, real value, the inflation-adjusted value of imports into the United States, the biggest fear that opponents, the biggest economic fear that opponents of free trade have is that the more we import, the fewer are our jobs. Put it in reverse, let's stop importing or let's reduce our imports so we can increase domestic employment. And this graph shows, uh, by the way, I get most of these from uh, the, either the Bureau of Labor Statistics or the uh, 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 St. Louis Federal, Federal Reserve Bank. These are all government statistics, uh, widely accepted as being as valid as such statistics become. So we can see that green line from 1950. At first, in, the growth of imports into the U.S. was reasonably slow. Europe and, and, and Asia were devastated by World War II. Transportation uh, technology back then wasn't as good as it is today. Communication technology wasn't as good as it is today. We can see starting in the 1980s, imports start to grow faster than the amount of imports we take in annually, that we buy annually in the U.S., starts to grow faster. And there's no obvious 
fact, there's just none. There's no negative effect that you can detect of increased imports on the number of jobs in the economy. If the standard protection story were correct, that more imports mean fewer jobs, then we, would, we should see that effect in that yellow line. That yellow line should either fall or at least, uh, at least tilt down or, 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 or have some noticeable kink in it, and it does not. And by the way, this is just one picture. There are very few things in economics that have been studied more thoroughly than the relationship between jobs and imports. And very few economic relationships hold as strongly as the one that says that there's no noticeable impact on the total number of total amount of employment and the amount of international trade or the amount of imports. What imports do, what trade does, is shift jobs from industries in which each country is relatively inefficient at operating to industries at which that country is relatively efficient at operating. So it does destroy, trade does, some particular jobs, but it also creates jobs in other industries. So the total number of jobs in the economy is unaffected by imports. And this graph is a very nice way, I think, to, uh, to show that. Next graph, please. One fear, or a related fear, that many opponents of trade have, uh, particularly opponents in a wealthy country such as the United States, is that uh, uh, high-paid Americans can't possibly compete with low-paid foreigners. That, that story has a certain uh, initial appeal to it, right? I mean, if, 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 the, if the typical Mexican factory worker makes $4.50 an hour, the equivalent of four fifty an hour, which I think is about right, and the typical American factory worker makes the equivalent of about $25 an hour, which is about right. Now, how could it possibly be that an American worker making $25 can compete with the Mexican worker making only $4.50 an hour? And so we have to, we have to, we have to block trade with the Mexicans so, so high-wage Americans don't have to keep their jobs only by having their wages lowered to the Mexican rate. But this is a mistake. This is a fundamental economic mistake. And I want to, I want to convey the error to you in the way I convey it to my students. I'm going to ask a question, and I want to show of hands. Uh, and, uh, it's, a, it's an honest one, an honest answer. How many people in here would like to have LASIK surgery, but who has not, but who have not had LASIK surgery? How many of you would like to have it but haven't had it? You like it? Why haven't you had it? Get, oh, so it's the cost, right? right here's another. I'm a doctor. I, am, I have a PhD. Right? So here's the deal, right? Suppose I offered a, a LASIK surgery for you, one ninety nine an eye, a buck ninety nine an eye. Can you afford a dollar ninety nine? Yeah. Would you let me perform LASIK surgery on you for dollar ninety nine? Why not? You, you, you're very wise. Right. <laughs> right. Right. The, the point is, price is not the only thing that matters. It, it, of course, it matters. But what you get for what you pay matters, right? You're not willing, no matter how low my price could be, I could pay you to, to perform LASIK surgery and you would still refuse it, right? What, what, what matters is what you get for what you buy. American workers, as it happens, are about five to six times more productive on average than are Mexican workers. Not because American workers are smarter, they work harder, we, they're more sober. It's not the reason. American workers have more capital to work with. And by that, I don't just mean have more machines in a factory. They have more roads, more smooth roads. They have better ports and docks. They have a better legal system, a, more, a, a, a less corrupt legal system. Workers in America produce more per hour than do their equally intelligent and hardworking Mexican counterparts. That's why American workers get paid more than their Mexican counterparts. This graph here shows the relationship from 1947 through, uh, looks like 2016, of real hourly compensation in the United States and real labor productivity. There are economists get into some disputes about how to measure labor productivity. Uh, this measure comes from the Harvard economist Martin Feldstein, who's a pretty uh, well-respected expert on the matter. The red line shows real labor productivity, you know, how much on average workers produce per hour, and the blue line shows hourly compensation, wages and fringe benefits. And as you can see, as productivity rises, wages rise. And 
the, that rise in uh, productivity has kept pace, oh, excuse me, the rise in wages and, and compensation has kept pace with productivity over time. And so if American workers are worried about their pay, they should worry about their productivity. They should want government to pursue policies, not that protect their employers or that protect other American companies from competition. Over time, that lowers productivity. If you're protected from competition, you feel much less urgency of remaining efficient, of finding new efficiencies. And so under such policies, labor productivity would grow more slowly and hence wages would grow more slowly. And so workers need not worry, high wage workers in places like America or Germany need not worry about trading freely with low wage workers in places like China or Mexico. Uh, while the wages in those places are lower, so too is the productivity of workers there. And so there will be jobs for workers in both kinds of countries, high wage countries and low wage countries. Next slide, please. I like this, it's like I have, I have this like genie out there, I just give a command to it and it happens. Um, the yellow line, uh, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, shows uh, real inflation adjusted, hourly compensation, and again this is wages and what are called formal fringe benefits, the monetary value of things like uh, health insurance premium, contributions to 401k plans and the like. The, and so this is from 1950 through uh, 2016. And as you can see, U.S. hourly compensation has risen pretty substantially over that time. The green line is one you've seen before a few slides ago. That is the real value of imports into the United States, the inflation-adjusted value of imports. If it's true, as many protectionists claim, that as we import more particularly from, from low-wage countries, hourly compensation falls, workers get paid less, then we would see a decline in, or at least a flattening out of that yellow line. And we don't, we don't see that. So imports increase very dramatically. The yellow line stay pretty much on, on par. And by the way, I think a case can be made that that yellow line, if anything, to the extent that it's a mismeasurement, I think there are, there are problems with it, I think it underestimates the growth of real wages, but that's, that's uh, uh, another story. But based upon pretty conventional measures of imports and U.S. Uh, worker compensation, there seems to be no obvious uh, decrease in that compensation caused by pretty rapid rise in imports starting about 35 or 40 years ago. Next slide, please. A lot of people worry about the trade deficit. Um, the trade deficit is sort of a, 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 a pedestrian term for a more full concept called the current account deficit, but I'm happy to use trade deficit. Uh, but what people don't realize when they complain about the trade deficit is that the trade deficit is the mirror image of another international account called the capital account. So when, when you turn on the news, you listen to the news, you get something over Reddit or something, so it's complaint, I don't know if people complain about the trade deficit on Reddit. But whenever you hear complaints about the trade deficit, which you, if you pay attention to the news, you will hear complaints about the trade deficit incessantly, um, you can substitute in your head another term, capital account surplus. Capital account surplus is another name for the trade deficit. When foreigners, when, when foreigners act in a way that causes America's trade deficit to rise, they do so by, so when, when for, foreigners sell stuff to us, and they get dollars in return, the dollars that we spend. Foreigners are just like you. They can either spend those dollars buying American outputs, or they can invest those dollars. Dollars can be spent or invested ultimately only in the United States, or Panama, it's a small exception. It can be spent only in the United States or invested only in, in the United States. When America's trade deficit rises, what that means is Foreigners are choosing to invest more in America. Why is that bad? If you're walking down the street one day and you run into Bill Gates, and Bill Gates talks to you for half an hour, and he's so impressed that he offers to invest in your future, do you feel bad? You may or may not take him up on his offer, but surely you don't go home and complain to your parents and think, you know, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? 
a really astute business person wants to invest in my future. What am I doing wrong? No, you'd be gleeful, you'd be happy, you'd be proud, and rightly so. And it's the same in this case with the American economy. When foreigners choose to invest more in the United States, when they choose to increase their investment holdings in dollar-denominated assets, they are choosing to do so because in their estimation, the American economy is more promising, has a more promising future than does at least most other economies. An economy that's running a trade surplus is an economy that is probably viewed very skeptically by global investors. An economy that is running a trade deficit is an economy that is almost certainly viewed positively by global investors. Maybe the global investors are wrong, but the United States has run a trade deficit every year since 1977. And as I said, because I'm a few months older than you, I was alive in 1977, most of you were not, and yet let me assure you, the United States today is vastly richer, even for middle class Americans, than it was in 1977. When foreigners invest in America, that's not only a sign that they believe in the future of the American economy, at least relative to most other economies, but the investments themselves help the US economy. If you applaud when your neighbor saves more to expand the factory down the street, to allow, uh, to, to, to supply capital for that upstart tech entrepreneur, if you applaud when your neighbor does it, you should applaud when someone from Canada or someone from China does the same thing. This graph here shows the mirror images of the capital of the trade deficit and the capital account surplus. A trade deficit is simply another name for, a, a, I think a misleading name, for the capital account surplus. Every time our trade deficit rises, more people are investing, more foreigners are investing in the United States. And I think that is generally a cause for celebration and applause. Next slide, please. Um, the green line shows the U.S. trade deficit from 1950 through 1916. Uh, uh, the yellow line shows U.S. civilian employment. Again, if you listen to people who complain about the trade deficit, I don't have to name who they are. And by the way, it's bipartisan. Um, uh, in the United States, Democrats complain about the trade deficit just as much today now as the Republicans complain and worry about the trade deficit. That green, that yellow line is one that you've seen before. Again, U.S. civilian employment from 1950 through 2016. If increasing trade deficits have a negative effect on employment, surely we would see it. I mean, look how massively the U.S. trade deficit has grown over the past 40 or so years. It has had no effect on the growth in U.S. civilian employment. I think I have, do I have one, any, any more slides? Is that the last one? Ah, okay. One other slide, this is a, this is a myth uh, that I want to bust. We talk, you hear talk today about reviving America's manufacturing. Oh, America's manufacturing is in the, you know, it's in, it's in, it's in the toilet. We gotta we got bring back manufacturing of the kind we had in the 1950s. The fact is, American manufacturing output is as high today as ever. It's near an all-time high. The yellow line is real U.S. manufacturing output. In other words, the value of U.S. Value of U.S. manufacturing output adjusted for inflation from, this is from 1987 uh, through 2016. And you have to trust me in this, but if you go back before 1987, the, line, the trend looks the same. The, the top of that yellow line there, that means that U.S. manufacturing output today is at or near an all-time high. The green line is manufacturing employment. U.S. manufacturing employment hit a peak in June of 1977, and it has been falling ever since. People mistake declines in manufacturing employment for declines in manufacturing, and that is a fundamental error. U.S. manufacturing output is rising because of American ingenuity, because of global ingenuity. Factories today are a lot more productive. One worker today can produce far more output per hour or per day than could one worker 40 years ago or certainly 100 years ago. And that's why manufacturing output is growing while manufacturing employment is falling. If you think it's bad that manufacturing 
employment is falling. Let me point you to an earlier, and I'll end on this and take some questions maybe, let me point you to an earlier uh, major industry in America. In 1776, the year, you know the one thing that happened in 1776, the most important thing that happened, of course, was the publication of Adam Smith's book, An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. The other thing that happened that year uh, was the publication of Edwin Gibbon, uh, Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. The third thing that happened, of course, was the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Um, in 1776, estimates vary, but the low end estimate is that 80 out of every 100 Americans who worked, worked on farms. 80 it took 80% of American workers to feed 100% of Americans. Agriculture was the big industry back then. Today, about 1.5% of the US workforce works in agriculture. And yeah, agricultural output today is at an all-time high. It's obviously much higher than it was in gross and certainly per person, per worker, than it was in 1776. The reason for this is that productivity on the farm expanded greatly from 1776 through today. Mechanization, development of chemical fertilizers and pesticides, all of this increased productivity. We don't think that's a bad thing, we think it's a good thing. If 80% of Americans today still had to work in agriculture, you wouldn't have pediatric gastroenterologists. My son would be dead. You wouldn't have uh, the leisure, most of you, to go to college. You'd be working on a farm. You wouldn't have web design. The only web designers would be spiders. You wouldn't have, you wouldn't know anything close to the life that you have now. It's because workers have been released from agriculture and allowed to do other things that we now get the food that those workers would otherwise have produced and get what those workers what else those workers can produce now that they don't have to any longer work in agriculture. Same thing is happening now in manufacturing. We are getting more and more manufactured outputs and workers are being released to do other things like be gastro pediatric, pediatric gastroenterologists. I know I sound as if I'm um, uh, overly uh, uh, Pollyanna-ish about the economy. There are problems with it, but I am generally optimistic about the economy, despite all the problems. I'll end on, I'll end on with, with, with this one note from Adam Smith. It's not in the book, The Wealth of Nations, but Adam Smith famously said at one point, one of his students um, approached him one day and pointed out to him some, some foolishness that the British Parliament was up to. And, Adam, and this student thought that Adam Smith would join him in bemoaning the foolishness. And it was foolishness, whatever it was. But Adam Smith's reply is, uh, there's much folly in the world. And by, by that, what he meant, it was his way of saying, look, don't worry about it. The world's a very robust place. The market is a very robust institution. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make it as free uh, and, of, and even more robust as possible. But I generally believe that as long as we remain an entrepreneurial free country, uh, as long as we protect our freedoms, I'd like to regain some more, but as long as we protect our freedoms, will continue to prosper. Entrepreneurs will continue to innovate as long as we continue to trade reasonably freely with people across the globe. We'll all grow wealthier and freer. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions if you have any. So what has happened in the United States? The, qu the question is, uh, let me see if I, re by rewording it, if I capture the spirit. Um, my graphs look pretty optimistic, so, so maybe we don't need to change policy at all. Uh, I would, uh, that's not a, it wouldn't be a bad idea because U.S. trade policy over the past 80 years has become increasingly free. I am no great fan of Franklin Roosevelt but one of the few things that Franklin Roosevelt did uh, was to begin to make trade freer in the 1930s. Uh, we forget the fact, well, we'll remember it again very soon probably, but traditionally the Democrats were the party of free trade and the Republicans were the staunch uh, protectionists and then that flipped uh, after World War 
to two, and the Republicans became the, the party of free trade and Democrats the party of protection. We are now in a historically unprecedented place. Both parties are the parties of protection. Right? There is no free trade party left, apparently. Um, so that, I hope, changes. But if you just look at U.S. policy, U.S. US tariffs have fallen pretty consistently over the past 80 years. Um, uh, we have become more open to trade. Uh, transportation and communication technology has further increased uh, global integration. So uh, if I were to pour my energy, I mean, I would like to have just un complete unilateral free trade. That's my ideal policy. I think it would make things even better. Uh, but continuing on the same track that we've been on for the past 80 years would not be a bad thing. We would approach free trade asymptotically. We'd, we'd, we might not ever get there fully, but we'd, we'd get there increasingly. What I worry about now, uh, is, uh, for obvious reasons, is that uh, because both parties have become far more uh, hostile to free trade, is that trade policy will change, but not change for the better. It's going to change for the worst. We're going to, we're going to return to policies that were much more reminiscent of America in the late 19th century than in the middle part of the 20th century, and I think that would be bad. Uh, the, it, it takes a, it's a good question, it takes a little bit, not a lot, but it takes a little bit of concerted, concentrated thought to understand the case. The negative effects of free trade are easily seen. The negative effects of imports are usually concentrated in a handful of industries and people lose their jobs. It's not, it's not pleasant to lose a job. It's not pleasant to look at people losing jobs. The beneficial effects are more spread out. They are much more difficult to see. And, I, and, 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 and because it's, so you need more of an intellectual effort to see the benefits of trade, or at least more of an intellectual effort to see those benefits than you need to see the, the downsides, the particular downsides of trade. Trade does destroy some particular jobs. All economic change destroys some particular jobs. Uh, and so it's easy to see those jobs destroyed by imports. This, this fact combines with the other fact that it's, uh, it's easy to demonize, uh, people have been doing it for a long time, it's easy to demonize foreigners. Uh, I like to point out that in, uh, I think it was the year 2000, uh, at the height of the Atkins diet craze in America, uh, Krispy Kreme Donuts uh, shut down some large percentage of its stores and it said it's doing so because of the Atkins diet. I think it was probably correct. So Americans change their eating habits. They change their eating habits so much away from uh, carbohydrates that a major donut retailer uh, couldn't sell as many donuts as before. Right? So people lost their jobs. Uh, but there was no call then, and people were sad about people losing their jobs, but there was no call to, you know, no more freedom of dieting. Let's stop Americans from changing their diets whenever they want. Because you know, that, that'd be demonizing other Americans. You don't, we don't think it demonic. Uh, when someone changes his or her dietary habits or changes his or her spending from buying uh, a, a, a new car to a used car. We do think it's demonic or it's portrayed as demonic when people change their spending in ways that involve the uh, increased purchases of foreign made goods. And the emphasis there is put on the, the deed done by the foreigners rather than on the Americans. The, the discussion is always couched uh, in the form of the foreigners are flooding our markets with their goods. We're being inundated with foreign goods. Uh, they're dumping their goods on us. Forgetting that, I mean, in fact, none of this is literally going on, of course. Americans aren't being flooded. Hurricane Irene flooded, uh, not Irene, Irma flooded Florida. The Japanese, when I was your age, the Chinese today aren't flooding America with things. They're not literally drowning in MP3 players. Uh, we're, we're buying those things voluntarily. But it's hard to, de you don't want to demonize a consumer. So if, if the cause of job loss and the cause of factory closures, the cause of some business demise uh, uh, can be found in the actions of a foreigner, uh, then it's uh, particularly a foreigner who doesn't speak our language and who looks different than us, has very different institutions and cultures than us, uh, then it's, it's very easy to to deflect attention to what they're doing and to make it appear as if, or to paint the portrait as if, 
uh, America is being damaged by those Chinese people who are, are, are so intent on impoverishing us that they're sending us free goods. When you think about it, it's kind of bizarre, but that's what people think. Right? Do Donald Trump seems to really believe that China is somehow impoverishing America and enriching China by giving Americans more and more goods at lower and lower prices. And we're supposed to save ourselves from that awful economic calamity. So you can, it, it, it's easy to demonize foreigners. And finally, re relatedly, because it, it's a question that deserves a, 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 an extensive answer, um, there are always special interest groups who stand to gain from uh, uh, stirring up this economic misunderstanding. Uh, again, as I said in, in the talk, you show me a tariff, I'll show you a special interest producer group, usually a powerful corporation that is behind the, the protectionist measure. And, and you know, the corp people aren't very sympathetic to corporations, so, but, 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 but they are sympathetic to other Americans losing their jobs. And so corporations can, who are in encountering uh, increasing amounts of foreign competition can just allow the economic misunderstanding to, to play its role uh, and to generate sympathy for trade restrictions that actually wind up benefiting the corporations. It always amused me when Bernie Sanders' uh, uh, supporters th thought they were so uh, uh, anti-corporate, you know, anti-demand, anti-establishment, and yet they're you know, pro-high tariffs. You know, so they're pro-big American companies, because big American companies are, stand to gain from, from most of the tariffs that Uncle Sam implements. And, and, it, and to me, that just is evidence, that kind of attitude is just evidence of uh, a thoughtless approach to economics. We're going down the line here. Yeah. So uh, um, as I told someone at, at, at the nice dinner you guys took me to, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on trade agreements itself. I haven't studied the TPP in any great detail. I've looked at it a little bit. Uh, I've spoken to and read reports written by uh, uh, people whose expertise I, I trust. Uh, so my, my, my uh, um, take on trade agreements is the following. In an ideal world, we wouldn't need them. In an ideal world, uh, the United States would do what Great Britain did in the mid-19th century. It basically just declared unilateral free trade, what Hong Kong did uh, in the 1960s, just unilateral free trade. You don't need an agreement to do that. You just, okay, we, government says, we are not gonna stop our, our, our citizens from trading freely, however, they individually choose with people from around the world. That, and so that doesn't need an agreement with another country. Politics being what it is, um, governments being what they are, uh, a, it, it's an unfortunate fact that trade agreements, both bilateral and multilateral, uh, have, I think, proven to be an effective tool for reducing trade barriers. They're not my ideal tool, but given this imperfect world we live in, I believe that most trade agreements, and certainly the multilateral trade agreement that is the, the, the now the World Trade Organization, um, in, in that case, it, the evidence is, is pretty indisputable. Uh, these agreements do tend to reduce tariffs over time. Not completely, and it's not as if, and, 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 and not without coming along with uh, 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 appendices that themselves are unfortunate and counterproductive. But by and large, my opinion is that trade agreements make trade freer. And for that reason, I support them because I believe the alternative to them is not the freer trade or perfectly free trade that I would like, but trade not made freer at all. Uh, as far as the TPP, the people whose opinions I respect and what little I've looked at the agreement uh, uh, indicate to me that it probably would have been, if it had America been a signatory to it, it probably would have been much like the other trade agreements to which we would have been a signatory. Not perfect, not ideal. Uh, cont uh, uh, it would have uh, involved us in some unfortunate uh, maneuvers but overall, I think it would have made trade freer, and for that reason, I would have supported it. I, I, I wish we would get 
back on to it. Not because I think it's ideal again, but because it's 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 better than doing than not making trade f freer. So the argument isn't, uh, I'm going to give you a precise answer to your question in a moment. The argument isn't that protectionism can't help a particular industry. It could certainly do that. Uh, uh, the U.S. sugar industry is one of my favorite examples. U.S. sugar industry, America has far more sugar farmers, cane sugar farmers and beet sugar farmers, and far more agricultural land devoted to growing sugar than we would have w without the heavy uh, tariffs and import restrictions that have been in place on foreign sugar since 1934. Right? So that industry has certainly benefited. The argument is that that trade restrictions do not help, the trade restrictions harm the economy as a whole. It helps some particular industries, but at a much greater cost, or at a greater cost to the whole economy. Um, so, so the arguments for the theoretical arguments that I alluded to, the, the one big one is something called the optimal tariff argument. Uh, and it requires, the optimal tariff argument it involves certain assumptions about the, the uh, um, a, a big economy like America trading with really small countries. And America has, because of its size, uh, a lot of monopoly power. And it can exploit that monopoly power by using government to restrict the output. So we wind up getting actually more inputs for every amount of, of every, every export that we, we ship out. That's called the optimal tariff argument. In theory, you can show it nicely with mathematics or with graphs. Uh, but the man who did most to uh, formalize it was a British economist named Francis Edgeworth uh, in the 1880s, I think. Uh, he said that uh, the problem with this argument is that he says this, yeah, this argument is theoretically true, but it should be marked with a skull and crossbones and put in back of the medicine chest, because it's only theoretically true. Uh, and if you give it, if 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 it, if it, if it escapes from the medicine chest, uh, you know the kids will drink it and all poison themselves. Uh, governments will drink it and make the world a a, a, a worse a, a worse place. So the it, it you know we live in a complicated world, and. Uh, you can almost always find, you know, weird exceptions to general rules that we all agree should be should be adhered to, and this is one of those weird exceptions to a general rule that I think should be adhered to. Yep. Uh, considering all the cases for free trade, uh, what is the best way, in your opinion, in which governments can actually help to promote the, this kind of free trade potential that is really there? Oh, that's easy, right? Uh, if the government were populated by people like me, well, <laughs> right. so, so if you're asking, what is my ideal trade policy? Government should do what the British did in the mid 19th century. One, two, two of my great heroes are uh, two uh, old, long dead Englishmen, Richard Cobden and John Bright, who are leaders of the Anti Corn Law League in Manchester. Uh, and in 1846, um, the, the, the British corn meant basically all grains. Uh, the, the British uh, began a pretty quick march to abolishing all tariffs. Uh, and by 1860, uh, Great Britain was pretty much unilateral free trade. And so it can be done. I mean, a, 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 a great modern government did it. Um, the ideology in Britain in, during those times supported the ideology in America today would not support such a move, unfortunately. But if 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 I were a trade dictator, which sounds like a bizarre uh, contradiction term, if I were a trade dictator, I would just abolish all trade restrictions, just get rid of them. And no, I wouldn't need any agreement, any sign off from any other country. Uh, and I have no doubt that it would make Americans uh, richer. How much richer is hard to say. Um, we're, we're already pretty rich. We're already. Not a completely free trade country. We have largely free trade, freeish trade, and so what we're talking about here are, are small, you know, getting rid of small, a relatively small number of other restrictions uh, compared to the size of the economy. And so I, I, I don't know that 
that if, if America were to adopt the same policies that the British adopted 150 years ago, that the uh, impact on the American economy would be as measurable as it was in the British economy 150 years ago. Uh, I think it would be there, but it may be hard to detect. I don't think you need a global, I, I know you don't need a global currency to have free trade. That question, unfortunately, and, and I'm going to sound like I'm dodging it, which I am, uh, uh, because it involves, I mean, to answer it fully, correctly, uh, involves far more, uh, I'd have to get way more into the weeds of monetary policy and, and, and uh, uh, than I'm capable of and then I've and have the energy to do now. Um, uh, when Britain went to free trade in the 19th century, uh, gold was large, gold was pretty much the global current, not currency, but global monetary base. That's not the case today. Um, but I don't see why we would need that to be the case. Uh, if the United States, if the US government were intent on moving toward free trade, the US government could just say, we have no more trade restrictions. And then the value of the dollar would float according to market forces against the value of other, other currencies. Um, uh, no doubt other countries would today, as other countries did 150 years ago, engage in their own foolish policies. And that would affect the value of the dollar against the currencies. I don't think you would need, I don't think you need a global currency to have free trade. Maybe it would make free trade easier in the same way that, you know, we all use dollars in the United States, and so when you trade with someone in Wisconsin, you don't have to, you know, do currency exchanges, and that re the fact that we all use dollars, that reduces transactions costs. I don't see it, I don't see the lack of a global currency as being in any way any kind of substantial or fundamental barrier to free trade. Do you have a follow-up? Um, it looked like you did. Oh, oh, oh. Um, I don't know that you completely avoid, I don't know that you could, I wish you could. I wish, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm in no way against cryptocurrencies. I'm in no way against a global currency if one evolved naturally. Um, I wouldn't want the UN to impose a global currency because that to me would like imply a, you know, not, not, you know, global reserve bank, which would be really calamitous. Um, uh, but if such a thing emerged, uh, I think that would be good. Uh, but I don't know how, I don't, I believe that governments would pretty quickly figure out ways to tax and restrict imports, uh, even with such a currency. I mean, it may, may make it a little bit more difficult, but they'd manage to do it. They're, they're very clever. Okay, well thank you all for your rapt attention. I appreciate it.